three, two. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Callum Lang. How are we doing? I'm very good, thanks. I'm really looking forward to this. Yes, this is going to be a fun conversation. So Callum is the CEO over Progressive Partnerships, uh, a co-founder and CEO of MBH Corporation, PLC. Uh, it's actually a company that acquires small businesses around the globe. So very, very unique uh, what you're doing. Uh, but before we get into all that, Callum, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, so um, I've been an entrepreneur for 25 years now, um, written a few books about the, the journey um, and really been doing all sorts of things. Started off in recruitment at the height of the dot-com boom. Um, and then the last 10 years, I've really been focused on helping what I think is kind of a, a neglected part of the economy, which is the small businesses that aren't startups, but they're not big companies yet. Uh, they're 50% of the economy. Um, but it's almost impossible to connect those businesses with the capital markets or sophisticated investors. There's no financial product for the biggest part of the economy, which is a bit strange. So, um, yeah, I've spent the last 10 years grouping together small companies, taking them public so that they can get access to, to that capital and investors can get exposure to small businesses, but without the risk of an individual company. Um, and then in the last couple of years, um, one of the, I guess, perks or benefits of doing what I was doing was I got to sit on a lot of public boards. I got to advise a lot of boards. Um, and I realized that the board system is quite flawed uh, and that it's a very exclusive environment. If you don't look the right way, if you haven't been to the right schools, know the right people, you, you just don't get the opportunities. Uh, and so a lot of talent was being overlooked and a lot of people that were getting board seats that probably shouldn't have had board seats. Uh, um, and so a couple of years ago, I set up a company, Veblen Direct Program, to help women, minorities and first timers to get their first board seat. Um, and we've helped in the last year alone, we've helped over 200 people get over 300 board seats. Their oh, first wow. Board seat um yeah so that's uh that's fun and and it's something i think all entrepreneurs a should sit on other people's boards i think it's a great learning experience and b should have their own boards much much earlier in their journey um and so i talk about how how they can go about that it doesn't need to cost you a lot of money it doesn't need to cost you any money um uh, but it can be incredibly pivotal in your entrepreneur journey um, so yeah, that's kind of, uh, me, me in a nutshell. I also, uh, help people around capital raising and that side of things as well, just by virtue of spending so much time in that space. Yeah. You know, I, I got to admit, um, you know, sitting on a board, the amount of experience and, and education, free education you kind of receive by sitting on a board, uh, some are paid, uh, some are volunteered, uh, and, you know, asking, you know, is it a working board versus just kind of a, a meeting board, uh, having a good understanding of uh, the general rule of thumb, uh, I would say, like, you know, for the folks listening, uh, if you're going to go onto a board, if you're a board member at large, you're kind of expecting like one hour a week uh, and versus an officer, you're probably looking at about five. Uh, and 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 so so kind of think about it that way. But again, you know, to your point, the, the amount of experience and learning uh, and growth you get from that because you truly are running a business, right? The, the CEO or executive director or whoever's employed to run that business reports up to the board. So, so you, you, uh, you know, they bring us their problems. They do their feasibility analysis and present it to the board and, and the board's the one making these decisions. And so, uh, it's, it's really cool. And especially to, I think, to the point that you made, um, the, the size that you're working with currently, uh, it sounds like, you know, a lot of these board members are also very deeply involved with the work that goes on on the day-to-day -day basis, I suspect. Um, not, not necessarily. I mean, you, you kind of have exec board members and non-exec board members and, and, um, what, I mean, my, my kind of point that I think is, is super relevant is there's, there's 330 million companies in the world, give or take, uh, um, and less than 1% of those companies have an active functioning board. 
So it's a tiny, tiny minority of companies have an active functioning board. And yet every single successful company you can think of has an active functioning board. So clearly there's something missing there. And and I think the the way we teach our, our members, and uh, I talk about it in my most recent book, Boardroom Blueprint, is <clears throat> as a, a startup should have at the very least an advisory board um, and an advisory board doesn't need to cost you anything uh, it can be a, a monthly coffee meeting most of these meetings happen over zoom now anyway so it's super super easy um, and you and you don't need to pay these advisors the advisors often are doing it uh, a lot of employees a lot of executives are, are more than happy to sit on your advisory board because they get to live vicariously through a, an entrepreneur, which is is exciting for them. Um, other people do it because they want the experience. It's it's nearly impossible to get a good big board seat unless you've got board experience. So you kind of uh, it's this weird thing that at the end of your career you find yourself back at the beginning of the career where you can't get a job because you haven't got the experience, and you can't get the experience because you can't get the job. Uh, um, and that's how boards operate. So. Um, sitting on advisory boards, leveraging that up to, to get uh, other boards. And it can be super, super lucrative. We've got members that have made hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in their first year. Um, so uh, the, there's lots of ways you can, people tend to think about the salary. The salary is only one way of monetizing a board seat. So yeah, I, I think they're a massively overlooked and under talked about area of entrepreneurship. And I, and the reason is that they've been very exclusive and very mysterious for over a hundred years. Uh, I mean, in in big companies, everything grinds to a halt when the board comes in. Ah, oh, we've got to get reports ready for the board. Drop everything. <laughs> um, and it's like they're these mythical, magical creatures that fly in and have a board meeting and can change everything. Um, and so yeah there's there's a lot of weird perceptions about them it because of this idea of you can only hire a board member that's got experience as a board member what happened was you had a very small pool of people that were sitting on lots of board seats not adding a lot of value to be honest because they didn't need to they were being very well paid just to kind of tick a box um and what's nice now is that the the mood has changed investors that used to be the ones that would say we only want people with experience and now after the global financial crisis saying no we need fresh ideas on the board we, we don't want group think we, we want people that will challenge what's going on and ask the hard questions and that means in a corporate environment we want an entrepreneur um if it's full of old people we want a younger person if it's um all males we want gender diversity in there so Fortunately, uh, there is a little bit more pressure uh, to, to change, but equally, as you, you probably know, managing a small committee or a small board is a very difficult thing. And, and the reason why, even with all this shareholder pressure, there's been so little change, so little diversity added to boards, is that the risk for a public board, especially, of hiring somebody that turns out to not be good is incredibly high. Um, you know, if you hire customer service staff and they're no good, you fire them and hire someone else. If you hire a board member and they're no good or, or they're actively disruptive, if you fire them, the whole board looks incompetent and your share price plummets. If you retain them and put up with them, the average tenure of a board member is nine years. That's oh. a long time to yeah, put up with time. someone that's disrupting meetings. So um, consequently, boards have stuck with, well, we'll only hire what we know. Um, and so you need to kind of get around that. You need to build the relationships and build the trust uh, before they will make, make the, the logical step to diversity. But all, all of this creates opportunity for entrepreneurs, which is great. Yeah, you know, one of the things you you mentioned during that time is too is, is you you mentioned one of the books you wrote. Now, folks, I got to apologize. I think at the beginning of this conversation, I mentioned uh, that you were the CEO uh, of Progressive Partnerships, but that's actually a book you wrote, another book. So tell us about all these books. Some people call me author. Some people call me CEO. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So look, it, it's really uh, I guess followed my path. So 
the first book I wrote, which was nearly a decade ago, was called Progressive Partnerships. And it was really about how I had learned to scale small businesses and startups through partnerships. Uh, I didn't, I had to, I had nothing else. <laughs> I didn't have any resources. Um, and so I had to use other people's resources. And I learned through trial and error the best way to create partnerships and and grow to you know very very successful businesses through leveraging and helping other people get what they want and so that that book progressive partnership by, by the way if you go to callumlang.com um all of my books are free uh you just down download um you can download them from there i think bezos has enough money without selling more of my books there you go there you go <laughs> uh so yeah that's very much about that i then co-authored uh, a book with my business partner jeremy harbour called agglomerate which was about this idea of solving a problem for small businesses by grouping them together and taking them public um and then i i then spent quite a lot of time speaking to investors and in the public markets obviously and so i wrote a book called entrepreneurial investor which is or entrepreneurial investing which is really about how investors can benefit from this huge pool of talent that that hasn't had um hasn't had an influx of capital and and so is a um it's an undervalued asset uh, and i give the example of reits for example which you know, you're in the us reits are very popular in the us reits was a something that congress came up with uh, in i think it was the 50s and it basically they said look all the money is being made on these big commercial projects and big commercial property developments um and mum and pop investors can't get access to them so what we need to do they're too big they're too illiquid so we'll create reits which is a way of in today's world, we'll call it tokenization of um, these big assets, but allow people to trade little bits of them. Um, and it took a few years to to take off, but that became because you brought liquidity to an illiquid asset. What happened was that became a seven trillion dollar industry over the next uh, few decades. Um, now, if you look at small business. Small business is 50% of the economy, 90% of private sector employment. Yet, if you're a sophisticated investor, it's too risky. Um, you know, the, the, uh, it's it's too risky and it's too liquid. You cannot get your money back out. Like every entrepreneur will tell you they're going to exit in three to five years. It's a, it's a line we were taught at birth, but it doesn't mean anything because there's just not many exits out there. It's very difficult to do. And, and investors know that. And so... It's very risky to invest in a small business. Um, and so entrepreneurial investing was really about understanding that opportunity and that mismatch uh, and how you leverage it. Um, and then, yes, my last book was called Boardroom Blueprint. And it was really what I'd identified, which is um, once you're on the inside of these boardrooms, it's in can be incredibly lucrative, incredibly rewarding. The the contacts you make, the the opportunities you get exposure to, um, but you need to know how to get in, and you can't go in the front door. You, you, there's got to be a back door. And so, um, one of the public companies that I was involved in, we created an apprentice program to young people, disabled people, minorities let them get experience of sitting on the board there was no risk for us we didn't pay them we didn't give them votes um but we were able to learn from them they were able to learn from us and get that much needed board experience which could then let them go now they had the contacts now they had the experience they could go and, and start their board careers and that's really what kind of started the the veblen director program and and the boardroom book blueprint book is about my experiences, but also sharing many, many experiences of our clients who have um, gone on and done incredible things. They, they get offered much better board seats than I do now. It's very frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and folks, I got to tell you, it's it's interesting. Now, first, one uh, one kind of just a definition for you folks that, that we're talking about is a real estate investment trust. Uh, so it's essentially, you know, you can you can invest in real estate, but uh, a multiple homes kind of like just like a, a ETF, right, that you'd probably see in the stock exchange, very similar to that. But, you know, one of the things that's very interesting is is that I thought about the boards is the 
the kind of the structure that you have to abide by uh, on different boards because boards, you know, or, you know, they kind of have like a set policies, they, they kind of put voting in place, and you have to present things. It, it's a very kind of a formal structure in that sense. Uh, but with that said, folks, I, I got to admit, you know, having an opportunity to have now sat on a few boards, um, it's interesting, because as, as you mentioned, Colin, as, as soon as you sit on one, it's almost like there's more opportunities come available because people know that you're now in that circle, uh, which is which is a very, very small, as you mentioned, small circle. And so offers tend to come uh, uh, quite frequently to the point I've had a decline a few and because my wife is like, okay, you're, you're going a little bit too much, right? At some one time, right? But, but let's take a step back. Let, let's take a quick step back is let's, how did, how did you get to this point? How, where did your entrepreneurial journey begin? Sure. So, um, look, I, I grew up in, in the UK, so I'm a New Zealander originally, but I grew up as an immigrant in the UK, uh, a poor single mother um and so by default did the kind of hustling and like car washing was my first business um and graduated from from that i was uh i had one of the first ben and jerry's ice cream recipe books in the uk in um uh probably the late 80s early 90s and I used that to make and sell homemade ice cream to bars and restaurants around uh, my local town. Um, probably breaking lots of F and B rules, but <laughs> 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 um, that, that was uh, good. And, and yeah, kind of just went went from there. I think my first grown up business. So I did a degree in business and computing. Never quite finished it because the the dot com boom had taken off and I was offered a position at uh, a very big internet one of the biggest internet companies in the world and uh, I was never particularly good technically uh, I just didn't have that uh, yeah that, that attention to detail any person in the uh, uh, in that could articulate what was happening to managers and to customers uh, and turned out that was a very valuable skill so even though I broke things, um, I could then explain <laughs> what that meant. Uh, whereas my colleagues who were awesome coders would just grunt. Uh, um, and so I got kind of promoted very quickly up the ranks uh, and I started being headhunted. Uh, it was a time when there was far more need for technical skills than there was uh, technical people. Um, you know, the, the, internet protocol was a brand new thing um and i couldn't like i was early 20s being paid way too much money and being offered insane salaries and i couldn't work out why these recruiters would fly to amsterdam where i was at the time take me out for massive meals like, and spend all this money and i was thinking you know, why why are they doing this just to get me a job it's very kind of them uh, um <laughs> and then i then i understood their model and a lot of it at the time it was day rates and and uh huge money and i realized that they were once they'd done the deal they were getting 20 percent on top of everything that i made for the six month contract so i did all the work they just kept getting paid over and over again and i thought well that's a good game uh, um and because i was in the middle of all of that i knew all the ip engineers i knew all the telcos that needed them uh, so me and a business partner set up our own recruitment company, basically solving that that need. Um, and yeah, that was really kind of my first grown up business experience. And, and we're making lots of money. Um, I assumed that it was because of my natural talent and good looks. Um, and then <laughs> the dot-com bubble burst. <laughs> and suddenly all these telcos stopped hiring. Um, and yeah, it turned out I wasn't nearly as talented or good looking as I thought I was. And um, <laughs> it was a very rude awakening. Uh, but I was also kind of broken uh, at that point. I couldn't really go back to being an employee once you've been on, on the other side. So um one of the interesting when when i had been looking at business opportunities one of the trends that i got directionally right 
that made a few mistakes was directionally the internet was was booming um i hadn't realized we were in such a bubble um but directionally it was right it was just took a few years correction the other uh mega trend that was i thought was quite interesting was and this is way back in the late 90s it was people were talking about there was the largest transfer of wealth in the history of mankind from west back to the east um and i say back to because china had done that sort of a few hundred years earlier um and so you remember kind of the asian tigers and the crisis in the 90s and stuff uh, and as a young entrepreneur, I thought, well, hang about, if there's trillions of dollars going from West to East, surely it makes more sense to be on the receiving end of that game rather than the giving end. Yeah, fair enough. And so I said to my then girlfriend, now wife, um, look, I can get work anywhere. Um, she's a, a primary school teacher. I said, look, find something, something in Asia and let's go and do that for a few years. And she got a great job offer in Bangkok in Thailand. And so, um, yeah, we went over there uh, and it was, that was an incredible time. We ended up spending nine years in Thailand and it was, uh, again, as an immigrant, um, but also an immigrant that didn't know anyone, didn't know the language, uh, really the only opportunity was to be a, an entrepreneur. Uh, was to try and figure things out um and it was a much harder much much harder journey but it was also a great place to kind of learn my chops and and figure out what works and what doesn't work and and sort of you know if you if you can be successful in that environment you can be successful anywhere um and so yeah that was uh i spent nine years making a lot of mistakes in in uh, <laughs> in business there and then moved to sing i one one of my businesses took off um but i kind of needed to be in a uh a, a more developed economy for it to to go to the next level and and so uh we moved to singapore about 15 years ago i think um and that's uh, all all of my business is global and singapore is just a great launch pad to be anywhere in the world so um yeah that's, that's kind of how i got into it well let's 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 dive into that a little bit how how do you navigate you know you have multiple businesses you mentioned you you left from asian now you're in singapore how do you navigate international markets for global business expansion what are what are some insights you have on that yeah, look, I, I think it it's a little bit scary at first, but you realize that fundamentally humans are all the same. Um, you know, ev everything fundamentally still works the same. Of course, there's there's nuances that there are some markets that are easier in some re respects and harder in other respects. Um, I don't. I, I think you can always, as an entrepreneur, you can always find what works and, and what doesn't work. Um, and I think one of the lessons that I learned, um, not soon, um, I remember so Thailand, if, if you've ever been to Thailand or, or Southeast Asia, it's quite a relaxed culture. Um, uh, it's very laid back. And I was struggling to motivate my team. And I, I and I started, oh, yeah, you know, it's just ties are too relaxed. It's, um, <laughs> you, you know, it can never be successful. But what I realized was you go into a Starbucks anywhere in the world and everyone's the same level. Everyone's working hard and they're, they're committed and they're trained. And, and that was really annoying because it meant the problem wasn't, uh, tie it was the fact that i wasn't training them or getting the best out of them and and um you realize that in every every market you've got driven ambitious people and and you've got people that aren't uh and and that's fine and and i think as a startup or an early stage business you can't attract the best people um you can only attract what you can afford um and all you can do is do the best with what you can afford. Um, and so I think being open to that limitation, um, because I had gone from sort of height of the dot com boom, being inundated with brilliant people 
that wanted to work in that industry because that's where the money was. And so, and certainly when I was at a company, they had gone through a recruiter, they'd gone through HR, they'd gone through a first line of interviews, then they came to me. And my hiring was on point, like everyone I hired was brilliant. I, again, just proof that I was such a good hiring manager. Um, and <laughs> turns out when you're a startup, it's a very, very, very different process. And and so you have to uh, adapt uh, accordingly. But um, yeah, look, I think there's there's opportunities everywhere and there's challenges everywhere. So it's just picking picking your opportunities. You know, I think that's one of the difficulties about entrepreneurship is, is you know, identifying opportunities and picking the right opportunity. Uh, sometimes we tend to uh, identify a problem that maybe not uh, many people still have, and we, we tend to create a solution for this problem and spin our wheels, right? Uh, and, and with that said, I think you, you once, one thing you mentioned is you started, you had a partner uh, kind of creating this business and, and you've been expanding. Um, one of the biggest issues I think with partners uh, with entrepreneurship is, is finding the right strategic partnerships. How did, how did you go about finding the right strategic partnerships? Uh, and how does that kind of help expand your business? So what I talk about in the book, progressive partnerships is you, you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs about partnerships and they'll say, I, I tried one once and it didn't work. Um, and what tends to happen is we look at who would be our perfect partner. Wow, if we could just partner with Google, like that would just transform the, the business. And so you're kind of going from here, trying to partner up here, and you've got very, very high expectations of what they can do for you. And of course, A, you're probably not even going to get the meeting, but even if you do get the meeting, they don't really care about what you care about. Um, and so a lot of partnerships fail because of these mismatched expectations. And so what I talk about in progressive partnerships is start small and progress. And so basically what, what I mean is you start doing partnerships that people will say yes to, which means you're probably going to contribute more to the partnership than they're going to contribute. And it's got to work for you, even if they contribute nothing. And what I mean by that is I will go into a partnership with, um, a media public so a small small magazine that nobody reads nobody cares about and i'll say hey look um i will become your partner i will introduce you to advertisers um if you can just put my logo somewhere in your publication i don't care whether they put my logo in the publication um what i care about is i can now go to the next partner and say hey i've got a media partnership with these guys um would you do something else that that works that uh, I can help you with. And, and again, I don't really care whether or not they deliver on that. I use it to bounce to another. I've got partnerships with this company and this company. And what happens is if you think about doing, so if you, if your goal is partnering with Google, for example, if you go to them now, even if what you're offering is absolutely perfect for Google, the risk to the employee that does the deal with you is so high because it's not about what's best for Google. It's about what's best for that employee. And if they take a risk on a new company or a small company and it goes wrong, if it goes right, nothing happens. If it goes wrong, they get fired. So it's not worth the career risk for them to partner with an unknown company. However, if you've now partnered with 20, 30, 50 people in your industry, there's now a career risk for them not partnering with you. Because if they don't partner with you and their boss says, hang about, these guys, like they've clearly been vetted by all these other partners. Yeah. Why are we not partnering with them? Now there's a career risk if they don't do it. And so this idea of progressive partnerships, um, and it really comes down to... <laughs> actually lowering your expectations. Um, I expect every partnership to, to not deliver what they say they're going to deliver. Um, and that way, uh, occasionally I'm delighted, uh, but, <laughs> but more often than not, I'm just leveraging it to get the, the next partnership. And what happens at a certain point is you build your own momentum and then people start coming to you. And when people start coming to you, that's a very different game because now you can set the terms and now they have to deliver because they've come to you. But you can't do that at the beginning. Um, so, and look, I, I kind of use that model. It's, it's basically the model that we use with 
um, getting board seats. You, you, you don't go to Apple and knock on the door. You go and start with some cafe around the corner that, um, yeah, can I help you build a board of advisors? And then you go to a tech startup that needs help with funding. Can I help you with, with that? And you build it up until you've got this. And, and look, it doesn't need to take long. I, I worked with a guy in, a guy called Ralph White in uh, Atlanta in the US. And um, he literally owned, owned a cafe, or still owns a cafe. He became an apprentice on a European public listed board, did some fantastic work for them around ESG reporting. Because of that, he ended up getting offered a, um, a non-exec director of a sports and entertainment company, a listed one in the US. Um, and all of that happened within nine months. Um, so it can happen very quickly, but you've got to kind of lower your expectations to to start with. You know, I, I really like the uh, the strategy of leveraging the partnerships uh, mentality. And, and folks, this is kind of goes like if you want to learn any industry, uh, one of the things I kind of pretty consistently talk about is fake it till you make it. And I don't mean like wing it. What I do mean, though, is finding a trade show or a conference or something and go to those trade shows and conferences. You can pay to attend as a member, learn the craft, really, truly learn the craft. And then from there, you can start to iterate, create your own models and, and grow from there. But understanding the baseline of any any market, any profession, because uh, you can truly do it. You can truly go out there and, and network and and build that build that collaboration with someone and a partnership to begin to begin to think about how you can continue to grow your brand. And I really love that idea. In fact, I might begin to start using that uh, the, leveraging the partnerships. Again, I don't care if you put my logo on it. It's just basically now I'm trying to leverage it for the next one uh, because you you do have to uh, you, you know you do kind of have to leverage those those things in order for you to continue to grow. And now let's talk about like embracing collaboration. It seems like, you know, collaboration is something that you want to embrace because it seems like it, it is a benefit to strategic partnership. Yeah, look, I think um, everything that I do is is based on uh, collaboration. I think collaboration beats competition all the time. Um, and um, I think the... You know, you can look at the success of any company and there will be pivotal moments where they have partnered and collaborated with other people to suppliers or uh, distribution partners, whatever, to to go to the next level. Um, and it, just like everything else that we, we've talked about, the it starts by looking at understanding other people's problems and how you can solve them it doesn't start with this is my problem how can you help me because nobody cares um and and it's a little bit like you know day one of entrepreneurship your clients don't owe you anything you have to be solving a problem for them to to get this exchange of value and and that's the same with with partnerships and, and collaboration um but a big a big sort of, uh, I guess, tactic that, that I use a lot, which I think is very useful is as entrepreneurs, we tend to get stuck in what and how questions. So, um, you know, what can we do to, to grow the business next month? How are we going to pay salaries at the end of this month? Um, and the problem with those questions is that we're asking ourselves and we don't know the answers because if we knew the answers, we would probably have done it already um and so you end up either jumping into the unknown or getting frustrated because you don't know the answer um and so i think when you change that to asking who questions everything changes so if you start asking all right who already knows the answer to this that i could be working with who would benefit the most if I'm successful? Um, so I'll give you a great example. I, I run a program called Guild, which is all about helping people to raise capital and, and learning to raise capital. And um, one of the things that I've been advising com companies that want to raise capital for years is most people sort of follow the Silicon Valley approach of build a deck, go and knock on a thousand doors and uh, and it's just soul destroying and and it's ridiculous because investors aren't sitting there with checkbooks waiting for you to 
do an amazing pitch that, that's not how it works so like that advice is so outdated um but the, the most the easiest way is to go to people in your industry um so go to your suppliers and say hey look we want to grow grow from a million a year to 10 million a year if we do that our orders for you are going to go from this to to this um we need some growth capital to grow now there's a couple of ways you can do that you can inject capital and be a shareholder or you can potentially give us products up front in return for a stake in the, in the future um and it's much much easier to do that because they already understand the opportunity whereas if you go to venture capital a you're going to get stuck in front of some intern who's only been taught one question which is what's your usp and they don't understand the industry they don't understand what you're trying to do um but but b like really they're not going to invest in you unless they've seen their peers invest in you unless it's been referred by somebody so um, much, much easier to go to somebody who already trusts you and who already knows the size of the opportunity. So who questions in whatever your problem is, is always, uh, I think, the, the best way of doing it. And that's why, you know, that ultimately is kind of what led to boards of advisors. And, and I started having boards of advisors before I even knew what the term boards of advisors was. I used to just find successful entrepreneurs and take them out and try and get them drunk and learn their secrets <laughs> um, <laughs> and um uh yeah ultimately those sort of became boards of advisors and and so i think those asking those who questions really is the the, the best way to move forward throughout your entrepreneurial journey have you ever had a moment of self-doubt <laughs> have i not uh, <laughs> Yeah, of course. Uh, and anytime I don't have self-doubt, something normally goes hideously wrong and I get <laughs> smacked down. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Like, you, you never, there's too many variables. Um, I mean, look, people come on podcasts like this and they share what's worked for them. Um, none of us tend to talk about the huge amount of luck that that is involved um yes there's things that you can do to control your outcome but 99 percent of what's going on in the world is completely outside of your control yeah employees having you know fares or money or the economy being destroyed by a politician like yeah there's so much stuff outside of your control that if you don't have self-doubt about uh what's going on um then you're probably delusional uh it's uh i mean yeah the, there's i think you, you can have a self-belief that whatever comes along you will deal with it um and definitely that's a muscle that builds with time um unfortunately you do need to get kicked in the nuts a few times to learn that it's not the end of the world um my business partner jeremy harbour has a great saying that that i really like which is being a an entrepreneur is like walking on a tightrope and if something goes wrong you fall off the tightrope but what you discover is that the tightrope was only a foot off the ground it's not the end of the world like if you have to shut the business down you have to let down clients and stuff it's not the end of the world you can get through it you can take the lessons and learn and, and move on so um i think that's a very good uh analogy but yeah, of course, plagued with self doubt. Yeah, that's that's a great analogy because I think uh, I think every big problem is the end of the world. Uh, every every other week, you're uh, fighting the is the business going to make it this week or next week? Uh, you know, and then it's almost like skateboarding. Like right? you have these moments where you have to push, and then you have these other moments where you get a glide. Right. And it's the gliding moments that we we all aim for in entrepreneurship. But then we're like, all right, now we're gliding. We've got to sell. <laughs> Start something new. I like the push and I like the challenge. <laughs> you know, now, now what what are some things like, you know, have been super challenging or maybe challenging that what are some of the things that you notice that are the most challenging for entrepreneurs that are that are trying to scale their business, either uh by themselves there within the the confines of their own country or even internationally? What are what are the what is like the most common uh, kind of thing you've noticed? Um, I think it's 
Look, I mean, the, the, the universal thing that all business owners look for is good people um, because ultimately that is the difference between success or failure. So uh, I think whatever stage of your journey um, and and I think, you know, coming back to my point earlier, it's very easy to say, I oh, like, yeah, there's just not good people out there um, or, you know, my it's yeah you can I, I hear a lot of people very dismissive about the talent pool um and and i think that's you know you have to take responsibility for that that we've never never lived in a world with so many talented people um and it's crazy i mean so i i because of i guess the the global outlook that that i have i don't limit my hiring to who's in the local neighborhood i look for the best people i can afford anywhere in in the world and and um if you look at veblen director program which is has been very successful that company's less than two years old um but our cfo is in melbourne australia um I'm based in Singapore. My CEO is based in the UK. My COO is based in Portugal. Oh, the wow. rest of the team is dotted around Asia. Uh, half half of the and South Africa and the US. Um, m w way more than half the team I've never met in person. Uh, and and I really don't need. I'd love to. I'm sure at some point we we will. But. Um, if you yes you give up some things by not being in the same room as somebody else but your pool of talent grows exponentially and as long as you're not a micromanager and you focus on results rather than process um then it it becomes really easy and there's just so many talented people out there in the world um so i think uh and look, I mean, this is sort of our approach with board members. There's there's companies out there that want to be able to look you in the whites of the eyes and um, sit down with you in person. Great. Good for them. They've got a very, very limited pool of talent that they can reach for. There's other companies that say, I just want cool people people from around the world that can make stuff happen um and of course they're going to get the best boards and be able to move faster and do more so uh look i think um more and more people have to be thinking in terms of uh remote working and working with the best people uh and and i think that's a, that's the universal factor that that slows any growth down is your ability to to attract great people to your company you know, I really like your analogy that you use uh, with with uh, Starbucks, because it's true, you know, when you go into Starbucks, you tend to see, you know, I, I mentioned this, I think, in a previous podcast is like, you know, when you're when you want customer service, you don't want your uh, you go to Starbucks, you don't want your order, you know, correct sometimes or usually you want it correct always. Right. And they, they created they created policies and, and you know processes in place to get the end result. That's that's all they care about is the end result. They want it to be a standardized result. In fact, folks uh, that may not know this, uh, Steve, uh, the the um, Howard Schwartz that uh, that started Starbucks, he actually got this idea from going out of the country and, and actually seeing these cafes in Europe and wanting to bring that that same type of feel to the United States. So I think that goes back to Colin's point, you know, going outside of, of your own country and thinking outside of the box is, is very, it's a very good way to not only inspire and create new ideas within yourself, but you can find some phenomenal talent out there. It's truly, it's truly a, a remarkable. So, you know, start to think about that as well when you begin to uh, look at growth. Now, what would, what advice would you give uh, so, to an inspiring entrepreneur? Um, look, I think, the game has really changed uh, a lot. When I first set up my recruitment company in Holland back in the late 90s, um, I remember we spent nearly 300,000 euros uh, or guilders at the time, but euros, 
um, on building a CRM piece of software, uh, customer relations management to, to manage all these recruits, um, because that was what you had to do. Um, and yeah, today you can get free CRM software that is a hundred times better than the rubbish that, that we'd built. Um, so there's so many tools out there. There's so much information out there. There's so much opportunity out there now that there, there wasn't. Um, now, equally, that can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, but I think the, uh, I think the, the sort of the ability to go and test your idea before you go all in never used to exist. Um, and it does now there's no reason for you to quit your job and build a business before you've got customer orders. Um, and I, I developed a rule having made this mistake repeatedly many many times i'm a very slow learner um i finally came up with a rule for myself which was that i didn't launch a business unless i had at least uh five forward orders from clients or had raised at least 100 grand in um investor capital because if i couldn't get those the idea wasn't good enough and what i used to do was go and talk to my friends at the bar and say hey i've got this idea for the business and they go wow great idea and i'd say would you buy it and they go definitely and so i'd go away and i'd invest in it and i'd spend time and i'd build it and then i'd go back to them and say great i've built it and they go oh now's not a good time um but brilliant product well done uh and yeah you really kind of the the only true thing that matters is the response you get from the market and if you can't get, if you can't sit down, so every business that I've done is a Veblen director program. When I started that, um, I came up with the idea. I did a webinar, pushed it out to my network, invited, I think we probably had like 20 people on that. I said, look, this is something I'm thinking about doing. Um, if you would be interested in being in this first cohort, let's have a chat. Um, you'll put down, a, I think it was a $2,000 refundable deposit uh, if I didn't go ahead with it. Um, but if I do go ahead with it, I'll work with you and we'll get you that board seat. Um, and then once I had that, like I had five or six people said, yep, I'm, I'm up for this. Then I had to build it. Um, <laughs> I had to build it quite quickly. Um, but I knew that there was a market for it. Um, I did the same when I launched Guild Members. Um, and that's a much, much easier place to be building things rather than what I see a lot of people do is build it. And then you just keep adding value and go, and somebody says, well, yeah, but if it was just in blue and you go, oh, I'll make a blue one. And, and, you know, you're just constantly running around as opposed to focusing on having the hard conversations, which is, will you give me money for this? Um, because that's ultimately all that matters. Yes, yes, very true. It's it's all that matters is uh, will people reach into the back pocket and pull out their wallet and actually pay for the thing you created, designed, or service you are providing. Now, if folks want to are interested in learning more about you, maybe learning more about uh, some of your books or the MBH Corporation, how do they find you on the websites, social? Where are you at? Yeah, so social LinkedIn is kind of home. Um, so yeah, uh, mention this podcast if you connect with me so that I can, I'll accept you. Um, CallumLang.com is hopelessly out of date, but um, uh, as long as you stick your email address in there, you'll get access to all of my books. Um, and I, most of the time I forget I have a newsletter, so it'll be like six months before I actually email you. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, um, that, those are kind of two, two main places. Perfect. And folks, don't forget, if you forget any of this information, you can also subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter that is sent out weekly. Go ahead and visit theshadesofe.com. You can also follow us on all of the social sites at the Shades of E. And if you are so inclined to, you can become a Patreon member. For $5 a month, you can help support the show. Go ahead and visit the Patreon and look for at the Shades of E. $5 a month, you can help uh, support the podcast, which allows me to continue to bring on phenomenal guests like the one calling in 
from day again from Singapore. So so it is like eight in the morning, almost nine in the morning now over there, as it is almost six p.m. here on the West Coast. So again, thank you so much for joining the show. A very very enlightening education. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and connect with you via email offline. Uh, I'm actually running a business accelerator program, uh, and so I, I think we have you know some businesses here if if they want to go into that route, love to have that connection. Uh, as always, folks, uh, please go ahead and subscribe to the newsletter at the Shades of E. Thank you and have a great night. Cheers.